All right, hello and welcome to Awkward Family Conversations, where we have intergenerational discussions between my dad, addressed to millennials and Zoomers. This is my dad, Rhett, and he is a Myers-Briggs personality type INFJ. Hi, Dad. Hello, Ed. Very, uh, very nice. Um, yes, I am. Uh, INFJ. So thank you. Thank you, Ed. This is my daughter, Addie. Uh, she is a recent uh, graduate, and she and Brad Paisley have something very much in common, which is to say that they went to the same university in Nashville, Tennessee, Belmont University. So uh, <laughs> she uh, graduated with a degree in audio engineering, which she has used to become a veterinary assistant. So. Uh, wow, you're really, really selling me here, Dad. Uh, well, I mean, uh, no, follow your passion. I'm very proud and very excited that you're doing what you want to be doing with your life. Um, and, uh, you know, you do have the musical thing going, but uh, you also have the animal thing going. So, Kudos to you. Uh, before we start today, though, we have a little, a little bit of follow-up from last week. Um, in reviewing the tape from last episode, I realized that I may have made a bit of a hash of the uh, points I was trying to make around the principle of substitution. So as we talked about last time, uh, supply and demand, that intersection of supply and demand for any product or service uh, sets the price for it. And uh, that includes job, uh, jobs are a, uh, a job market. So uh, compensation is included in the uh, in that market. And, uh, you know, anything that increases the supply will reduce the, the price of, uh, of, a, of a good or service. And since you're as an employee, as a worker, you're providing a service. Um, you know, the greater the supply, the less, uh, the, the lower the price, the less leverage you have to um, to have an increased price. And so, last week's topic was about uh, you know how do I find a job or why why can't I find a job that I can live on? Um, and there's certainly a lot of uh, uh, structural uh, challenges there, and we talked about all those. But um, you know, one of the one of the principles, uh, one of the economic principles we touched on was the principle of substitution. And what substitution is, is you know, it, it substitutes, one thing can substitute for another. And the more substitution you have, the greater the supply is, because what substitution does is it creates the, it increases the supply, which then reduces the, the cost, uh, i.e. Uh, the, the cost of compensation, which is what worker, what employers pay their, their workers. Um, to counter substitution, um, you know, we, you need to find, find the things that add value that matters uh, so that people are willing to pay you more. And so we talked about some of those things being you know, th easy things to do, well, I, not easy, but things that uh, uh, you can do that are uh, like show up on time, you know, bring your, bring your uh, energy for the entire time you're there, um, you know, find ways to, to solve problems. But you can also increase your value to the organization and make yourself less substitutable uh, by increasing your training and becoming more adept at your job, uh, uh, engaging around uh, uh, things that are important to the to the employer, those, those types of things. So anyway, that's a little bit better said, I think, than what I did last time. So uh, moving on then to today's topic, what is today's topic, Annie? Today's topic is how to budget and then live to it. This could be the most exciting episode we ever do, frankly. This is, uh, this is great. But uh, before we dive in, why, why did you pick this topic? Uh, by the way, Addie picks most of our topics. So. Tell me why, why you want to know about this. I um, want to know about this because I like to make a budget and I also really like going out to eat. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm going to spend $100 on dining out this month. And then I don't. <laughs> you don't spend $100 or you spend more than $100? I spend quite a bit more. Yeah, yeah. I see. So this is all about you going out to eat. Okay. And how can I afford that? How can I spend three hundred dollars a month going out to eat without getting evicted? Well, okay, so we'll uh, we can uh, we can dive into this. Uh, you know, so like we always do, I, you know, we do two minutes of internet research to see if this is truly a thing. Um, <laughs> you know, is is budgeting really a challenge for uh, uh, people in general? I couldn't find specific information in my two minutes of internet research on uh, millennials and Zoomers specifically. But I did find a survey from uh, last May, May 2019, you know, on bet.com that said that, uh, in fact, 93% um, of their respondents felt like budgeting was something that everybody should do. Uh, so it's definitely something um, that people feel a need for. I mean, I mean, 93% is massive. It's just about everybody. Everybody, almost everybody in the world, everybody in the U.S. feels that budgets are important. 
however, only two thirds of people actually take a stab at a budget. And so there is quite a bit of gap between, you know, you've got a bunch of people who think, yeah, this is important, who aren't doing it. Um, and I'd be curious to understand, you know, kind of why that is, but that it would have exceeded the two minutes that we allow for internet research. So, um, but I did also uh, uh, come up with a, a definition of what is a budget, because I think a budget can be intimidating for folks that haven't dealt a lot with, uh, uh, with money and, and don't really understand when we're talking about budget specifically what it is. And a um, good, uh, good definition I found was, uh, it's an estimate of income and expenses for a time period. So we can deconstruct that a little bit. There are four elements there that are important. Uh, the first is that it's an estimate, right? You're not, you're not trying to get to the penny that I'm gonna spend this much four weeks from now or four months from now or a year from now. You know, you're just trying to estimate you know, what you think um, uh, an expense or an income uh, would be. So don't, don't go crazy trying to make this too precise. Uh, the second part is you know, it's an estimate of income. So what you're gonna be making and you know, what, what kind of money is gonna be coming into your pocket in this time. Um, and then what's your, your expenses? What are you gonna be spending uh, in this time? Uh, and, and in this time is an important part of that because I think a lot of people um, get intimidated and they think, oh my God, you know, I've, I've, got, I've got to have you know, 12 months of rent um, that I have to pay this year. Well, if you're doing an annual budget, that's true, but you don't have to have 12 months of rent right in your, in your hand right now. You need one twelfth of it now. You need another twelfth of it one month from now. You need another twelfth of it two months from now. And that time dimension is really important when you're budgeting. I think, uh, you know, you, you, you can, if when you add the time dimension, you've got your income, what you're bringing in, your expenses, what's uh, going out, what you're spending, and then you've got this time dimension. And, um, you know, I, I think that time dimension is just as important as the other pieces. You've got to know the kind of time in you're in so that you can uh, really lay out a nice, um, uh, you know, a nice budget, a nice estimate of, of, of what those uh, income and expenses are going to be. And they don't have to be, this doesn't have to be super elaborate. You can have very big, very broad categories of, um, of both income and expense. Um, you know, you can make income in a lot of different ways, but really maybe you only really need one category, which is money coming in. Um, you know, expenses going out, um, you can get as detailed as you want, but um, take it from a guy who spent a lot of years in corporate finance, uh, you know, the more detailed you make it, um, the tougher it is to estimate. Um, it's much easier to estimate bigger numbers, aggregate numbers, than it is to uh, estimate each individual line items. Uh, so, uh, so as it relates to you, um, the, uh, um, going out to eat piece, you know, you're going to want a line item for going out to eat, but maybe you don't need a line for uh, each component of your utilities. You don't need a line for gas, electric, telephone, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe you just need a, a category called utilities. So. Um, there are a lot of budgeting tools out there. Um, easiest one to use is, well, I mean, the, the simplest one is paper and pencil. You can just start writing, you know, on a piece of paper, just lay it out, you know, in my months or my weeks or whatever it is. Um, you know, along one axis and then what I'm bringing in and what I'm spending and you can do that. Uh, they do have spreadsheets though and that's actually the same type of thing and maybe a little bit uh, more efficient and you're not going to make math errors if you're, uh, um, you know, using a spreadsheet. So those, that's, that's probably the easiest thing, but there are a lot of apps and there are a lot of uh, websites you can go to and they have tons of tools. Uh, Debt.org has got a nice uh, budgeting thing. There's some uh, financial planning uh, software uh, companies that have come up with apps, uh, both Personal Capital, Mint, um, are just a couple. Um, they would love to manage your finances so that you enter all the information and they store it and then you can go back and use it. But of course, they're using that information to uh, see if there's opportunities to sell you services. Um, and so uh, just be aware that if you're going to use a third party provided software, um, especially if it's free, uh, they have an agenda and they're going to be they're going to be looking at your information to see how they can sell you credit cards or uh, investment services or things like that. So. What uh, do you, so let me ask you, uh, do you budget, uh, you and your friends, uh, your Belmont University friends like Brad Paisley, do you guys budget or do you, uh, uh, or do you just kind of wing it month to month? Well, I can't answer for Brad Paisley. Um, what I do and what my boyfriend does, is we actually both have the same Excel spreadsheet. He found some template online, downloaded it, and then sent me a copy of it, and then I made it better, and then he got jealous of my better one, so then I had to send it back to him. Okay. Um, but I use that, and it's less 
budgeting and it's more keeping track of it. Like I have an idea in my head of what I want it to look like. Um, and then when it gets to a certain point, like if I'm in the middle of August and I spent quite a bit more than a hundred dollars going out to eat, I'm kind of like, okay, um, so let's just bring lunch to work every day, the rest of this month. And I'm not going to be like, you can't ever go out to eat the rest of the month because that's just not realistic and I'm going to do it. But it's easier than to plan ahead. But I don't, I don't know if I'd call that like a budget tool. I wouldn't. Well, it's a budget tool for sure, but it doesn't yeah. sound like you're actually using the budget tool. Um, I am. I'm using it to a certain, especially with groceries, I've been a lot better with because uh, I've, I've always been pretty good at grocery shopping. Thank you very much. Yeah. Always go with a list. Um, right. Start and of course, of course, being vegan in Nashville, there's, you know, fun stuff coming out every single week and it tends to be expensive stuff, but I've like, I try to keep it around $50 a week for groceries, which helps a lot with my produce delivery service. Um, cause that's only like $15 a week breaks down yeah. to, which is nice. So then I have $35 to spend on other fun stuff. Um, but it definitely like the budgeting tool has helped because it makes me realize like, how much of a difference buying the eight dollar thing of burgers is versus just getting some beans <laughs> so i don't i tend to actually i've reined in a lot of grocery spending like i don't really buy vegan substitutes anymore because it throws my grocery spending out of whack and then instead of buying like a bag of rice and three things of pasta i have exactly two burgers and it that doesn't make any sense <laughs> So yeah, so so you're you're budgeting in your mind. I mean, you're using the yeah. tool. You're using a historical information, which is a great way to get information to make estimates, right? I mean, we talked about what a budget is. It's an estimate of income and expense, meaning it's an estimate of future income and expense. And you're not using the budgeting tool to estimate future spending or income, but you're using it to inform uh, what you are spending. Yeah. Um, and I suspect that you're probably making allowances in your mind for your internet service and your telephone. So. Well, you don't pay for your cell phone. That's something you should probably talk about. <laughs> no. Anyway, uh, not yet. Yeah, not yet. But uh, you know, when there'll come a time when you're paying for your own cell phone, your car insurance, those types of things. Um, and that. Uh, you know, what's that? I paid for my car insurance. Uh, no. This month you, I did. Oh, did you? You didn't. It's uh, on a six-month cycle. Yeah, I could avoid it, so I did. Oh, okay. Well, good. All right. Well, excellent. So there you go. So it's in your mind, and uh, you're using. You're using the budgeting tool to give you information that makes your mental budgeting easier and more accurate. Um, so that's another way to budget. So you're you're probably doing the minimum qualified budget, uh, I think, because you're really you're you're not putting it down. You're not uh, laying it out in uh, black and white on a spreadsheet that says. But you're keeping track in your mind of okay, well, this is how much I've spent already, and I've got a budgeted amount in mind, and so. Uh, uh, you know, so I think, you know, if you invested a little bit more time with the budgeting tool, you might find that it would, um, you know, that it, that, it, that it could be very helpful for you so that you're not um, having to, you know, you're not having to take two weeks, half the month and, and not go out to eat, which is something you enjoy uh, because you're, you know, you're, 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 you're working. Uh, uh, if you got a little more intentional, I guess, about your budgeting, the, the more intentional you live your life, the uh, more it will resemble what you intend, but um, and you that's, don't say. Well, that's that's that, that that's yes, pretty obvious. But not a lot of people are uh, are actually acting on uh, on that um, uh, in a lot of ways. But anyway, so let's uh, so so you're doing uh, what I would call minimal. You know, uh, aware you're aware of 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 what you're spending, what you want. Well, are you really aware of what you want to spend, or just what you can't? I guess that's the thing. Are you really being intentional about what you're spending or are you kind of being guided by the moment within some kind of constraints? Which as a plan, as a fan of plan spontaneity, I'm all about. I mean, I get it. And so, uh, you know, uh, you can set your buckets and then keep sort of track, but that's not the same as saying, well, I'm going to spend this much money here and this much money here. Maybe that's. I guess it's like, it's kind of somewhere in between. Um, like I, adjust accordingly if I'm grocery shopping and one week I know I need olive oil it's kind of like okay I'm not gonna not buy staples because it's ten dollars for a bottle of olive oil right. and so like, that's gonna have to be a little more but that's kind of one of those situations where I'm like all right so then maybe this month because like my budget is under my income 
like I, I do make more than what I spend. Thank God. So it's, that's one of those things that's kind of like, okay, that'll kind of eat into the savings a little bit situation, but $10 is not that much to eat into savings. And it usually ends up kind of evening out in the end anyway. Well, I think, and that's the important part, you know, when you're doing a, 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 you know, a budget. So this is a time, you know, it's an estimate and income and expenses for a specific time period. I mean, as I said, the more precise you try to make it, the harder it is to budget. If you're trying to budget weekly as opposed to monthly, that's, that's going to be harder. You know, if it's $50 a week in groceries, that's different than $200 a month in groceries because you can have those times when you're like, okay, this month I spent 70, but I got things like a big bag of rice that's going to last me three weeks. And I've got a, you know, a bottle of olive oil that's going to last me a month. And um, I'm not going to need to spend anything on those items for the next three weeks or two weeks or whatever that's left in my well, budget that's, period. That actually, that it does end up working out that way because I, my spreadsheets are on a monthly basis. Yeah. Um, I just, I do my grocery shopping on a weekly basis. So right. it's easier to think, okay, I have a $50, give or take a little bit on either end. Um, and like the week where I don't have to buy olive oil or vegan mayo or something, I usually only spend like $30, $40 on right. pasta and beans and various things like that. Yeah. So it's kind of like, it evens right. out by the end of the month. I usually do spend about $200. Um, it's just like to keep it in mind for each grocery trip is like, okay, I have $50 to spend this trip. Right. Well, no, that, and that's, and that's, ex I mean, that's, that's a perfect description. And again, estimate, right? I mean, you're saying about $50, but if you're doing the plus and minuses too, right? I mean, you know, you know that, okay, if you start at the first week of the month and you spend 55, you're kind of, okay, like I'm $5 over my weekly. So, you know, if I spend another 55, now I'm 10 over and I'm halfway through the month. And so, um, you know, you're keeping that mental track of what your Delta is to your, the difference is to your, uh, uh, to your uh, to your budget. So I guess you are budgeting. You're just doing it in your head. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Well, that's when you're a single person with few expenses. With few expenses, right? Yeah. The more the more expenses that you have to accom accommodate, and and frankly, the more income too. I mean, if you're talking about bonus incomes, which are periodic, you know, you've got salary, but not everybody's on salary, right? If you're on a per commission basis, um, you know, you you know that okay, well, I'm gonna I, on average, I'm gonna make, you know, five thousand dollars a month because of my commissions, but some months I'll make zero and some months I'll make 12 and some months I'll make three. And so um, it's tough to budget those kind of things. But you know, people are in those situations, again, this is why you wanna make it an estimate. Don't make it too hard for yourself so that it becomes too imposing so you don't do it. Um, you know, just take your best shot at it and then monitor it and see it, gather information and then you can make more intentional decisions. And your, and your estimates will get better the more information you have about what your behavior in the past has been. And so, uh, you know, a budget really is about, it's an intentional um, uh, description of how you're going to spend the money that you're making and how you're going to make the money that you're going to be spending and over what time period, um, you know, but, and, and you can make these things really, really complicated. But um, I think most, uh, my, my experience, the, the best budgets are the ones that are simplest and uh, easy to follow mentally. Um, because if you're, you know, if you're entering your expenses and a lot of people do this, uh, I'm certainly guilty of this earlier in my life. Um, you know, entering every expense you make into a Quicken or some kind of uh, uh, accounting software that allows you to track your expenses, which help you budget. I mean, you can look at a report that says, okay, here's your expense categories, and this is what you spent, and this is how much it varied. And, you know, when you do get into uh, situations where you're getting an annual bonus, for instance, you know that, okay, in March, I'm going to get a bonus of roughly this amount. I don't know exactly how much because that would be. But, I'll, but I have a sense for um, that. I, I know that I'm going to get something. Or I'm reasonably sure I'm going to get something. Um, and similarly, when you have expenses, you know, if you're if you're buying, you know, if you're paying for your your, your house insurance all once once a year, uh, to avoid interest payments during the year, you can you know you're going to have that. It's going to be lumpy. In other words, you know, you're, you're, both your income and your expenses will get lumpier as you as they get more complicated as you have more more facts uh, factors that come in. And so managing that lumpiness in the uh, you know, in a budgeting exercise, again, just focus on best guess. Best guess is fine. And, you know, get you 80% of the way to where you need and you'll be able to say, okay, am I on track or not on track um, with my financial goals? Because really the budget is a tool to help you achieve the financial goals that you set for yourself. So let's talk about some rules of thumb, um, benchmarking, things like that. I mean, you know, it, it can be tough if you haven't done a budget before. You're kind of like, well, what should I expect to spend? Um, and typically, uh, recommendation is that you're, you want your housing expenses to be no more than a third of your income. 
uh, some high cost of living areas, or if you're a low wage, relatively low wage earner, um, oftentimes your expenses, will, your your housing expenses will be more than that. Um, you know, another thing that I just saw was, you know, if you want your housing and tax expenses to be about half of your income, um, which is another, you know, which is a way to bring in, you know, kind of differences between state municipalities that would have different tax rates because, you know, we're all subject to the federal tax rate, but we have different state rates. And if you're in a state uh, like I think Washington, Nevada, they don't have state income taxes. Um, you know, then then you're in a place where you can probably spend a little bit more on housing and still be okay for the other categories uh, that you uh, that you have. Um, the other thing that's really important, and I think it's really been brought home during this whole COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic that we're still dealing with, is to have about six months of cash saved up before you start thinking about investing or, 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 or you know, doing vacations or any kind of uh, large expenses. Get yourself into a situation where you've got a, a separate bank account, uh, is probably the best way to do this, is with about six months of your spending, not your income, but your spending. So, you know, if you're, you're spending $200 a month on food and another $100 on utilities and let's say $1,000 on rent, and so I'm just trying to make the math work. Let's say you're spending fifteen hundred dollars a month on uh, on non non taxes because you you can take taxes out of this. If you're not making any money, you're not going to be paying taxes on anything. So, um, uh, well, income taxes. You'll be paying sales taxes and use taxes. But uh, if you're if you're you know if if you're looking at your your spending on stuff, um, you want six months of that. So let's say it's fifteen hundred dollars. You're going to want you're going to want nine thousand dollars saved up. In a separate account that you can call on at times of emergency when you're going to be out of work. Um, that gives you a lot more flexibility in, in terms of having to deal with, uh, and we'll be talking about work going forward. You know, we have a little bit already that uh, um, you know sometimes you get in a situation where you're just where the where where you really don't like your work situation. You want to have the ability to end that and not be stressed about how am I going to pay the rent uh, this month. If you've got six months worth of expenses up. Then something like COVID comes along, gets hit, you get laid off, you decide to leave, um, or you or you have an illness or something that takes you out of the workplace. Um, you've got resources to manage, so you know that that that's an important thing to keep in mind. So you you want to create that that gap. You want a difference. You want the expenses to be less than your income, and that that difference is what you save. You want six months saved up before you kind of do anything else with that with that extra money you got, like I said, going on a vacation or investing for a return or, or, or whatever. So uh, get that get that cash set up. Um, the other really good habit to get into is paying yourself first. We just talked about that gap in the savings, right? So if you're expecting, uh, so let's say you make $2,000 a month and you, and you spend $1,800 a month, there's $200 a month that you're saving. So you're gonna take that, that's the first thing you do is move that it's a best practice to pay yourself first. And you'll hear people talk about pay yourself first. What that means is put the money into your savings first before you do anything else, because then it's not in your bank account. It's not in your cash box, whatever. It's, 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 it's you, you, you've said, I, I'm going to save $200 a month. And the first thing you do is move that in. And now you're not tempted when the, when the, when you're, you know, sitting with a week to go and you haven't been out to eat for a week and you're sitting there going, Hmm, I'd really like to go out to eat. I have this extra two hundred dollars that I haven't spent. I'll use that um, to go out to eat, and that's that's how you end up not achieving your financial goals. Um, one one of the best ways to achieve your financial goals is to pay yourself first every month, so that you're you're meeting your savings goals, which are in line with your uh, you know with your your life goals. Um, that that that's a really really important thing. So um, you know that's probably the best. Uh, you know those those kind of things. Try to keep your house. Try to keep your housing, um, you know, at about a third. Um, you know, certainly no more than forty percent of your income. Uh, or when you combine your taxes with your housing, make that no more than fifty percent of your income. Uh, okay. Make sure you're saving six months. You have a six month cushion of expenses, not income, but expenses, and make sure you pay yourself first so that you're achieving your sales goals. Um, so I thought it would be helpful if we did a. Uh, we did a uh, sort of an illustrative uh, uh, budget here. So I want to uh, 
show you this. So I put together, uh, this is an original work, by the way, uh, that I did for a seminar I gave uh, earlier this year. Um, <laughs> illustrative budgets at different levels of earnings. So what I've done here is I picked uh, uh, four income levels. So the first column there is $25,000 a year. Uh, second column is 35, 50, and $100,000. So this is the uh, annual income uh, for our, our folks here. And then you're gonna have taxes. And uh, so the chart on the, or sorry, the table on the left shows that the actual, the, the raw numbers and what you see on the right is the uh, percentages of total income. Um, and you'll see that uh, in the end, you use your money in, you know, you use all of the money that you have as income. And that's because we're including savings and investing as categories in here. Um, when you earn a dollar or when you have a dollar, there's only two things you can do with it. You can spend it, uh, you can, you can uh, uh, spend it today on current needs, or you can save it, which is to say that you're putting that aside uh, to spend it later on future needs. Um, You'll see the two arrows there on the right, uh, marginal propensity to save, marginal propensity to consume. Um, you know, we're talking about tax policy, we're talking about taxes here, and you'll see that as your income increases, the percentage of the income that goes to taxes goes up. Uh, in the United States and in most countries, I think, around the world, we have what we call a progressive tax. So you pay a proportionally higher amount in taxes for every additional dollar you get. I mean, it's, it's step function, so it's not, um, it's not totally dynamic, but um, you can see that when uh, you know you make hundred thousand dollars, your tax burden is just under thirty percent of that income. Whereas if you're making twenty five thousand uh, dollars, you know that tax burden is in the low teens, thirteen fourteen percent total. Um, the reason for this and is because of these arrows: the marginal propensity to save and the marginal propensity to consume. With that. What that concept is, is for every dollar, every extra dollar, that's the marginal piece. So every extra dollar you have, are you more likely to consume it or are you more likely to save it? As your income goes up, you're more likely to save it. As the income is lower, you're more likely to spend it. And that's because, as you'll see in the table on the left, an awful lot of our expenses are not, they don't scale with, with income. You're not going to spend more on a cell phone service because you make more. Then you're spending when you, I mean, there's certain levels of cell phone service and cell phone service is, is pretty universally, um, uh, you know, you're going to spend what you spend for cell service, whether you make $100,000 or make $25,000. And so mm -hmm. obviously, if you're making four times the money as a percentage basis, if the expense is the same, uh, it's going to be four times lower as a percentage basis, uh, you know, for that, for that uh, higher income than it is for the lower income. And so... Because of this, because it's more likely that you will save the money, i.e. not consume it immediately, um, we feel like we, we expect people who make more to pay more in taxes because of this idea that they don't need it to meet the, their current obligations or their current needs. Um, uh, and and it, whereas if, you, if you're making less money, you need more of that money to just take care of your current uh, your current consumption. And, and you can see that as at the top of the chart there, that, that purple, uh, those purple bars are the retirement savings and your investments. And you can see that, uh, you know, when you're making $25,000 a year, you're not, you're not, you're not making, you're not in making enough in this, in this scenario is the scenario that I created. You're not making enough to invest or to save for retirement. You are putting money to your strategic, your emergency reserve, but in the budget that I've outlined here, which was basically taking um, uh, national averages, I, I looked at national averages for spending on groceries and internet and cell phone and entertainment. Well, enter entertainment was more of a, uh, a result, uh, but you know, transportation, those types of things. I've, um, you know, I looked to national averages to sort of inform me what would be appropriate levels to, to have. And so you can see that somebody making $25,000 is putting $600 a year, not a month, $600 a year to that emergency six month cushion that we talked about. So, you know, if you need, uh, let's see, what are we looking at? We got just under $20,000 in expenses. Well, just over if you add in the property insurance and health insurance pieces. Um, 
you know, half of that is going to be ten thousand, eleven thousand dollars, and you're paying six hundred dollars a month or a year. Sorry, six hundred dollars a month. It's going to take you a very long time to get to a point where you've got that cushion saved up. So there's no way that you're going to be participating in capital growth and, and, and uh, savings for retirement and investment, which is another reason we have Social Security here, is because there we had uh, back um, when, before Social Security was implemented, we had an awful lot of people who just weren't able to save enough money that would allow them to retire. Um, they had to work their entire lives. And so, uh, uh, you know, this, this is, you know, this is really important, particularly given what we talked about the last two weeks, right? Um, when you're in a generation that's facing the stiffest economic headwinds that any generation has ever faced at the start of their careers, and you're into a, <laughs> and you're into a, uh, um, a situation where you've got um, uh, wages for uh, people starting their careers declining, um, you know, this becomes, this is really, really important. This is why, this is why the millennials and Zoomers are feeling so much stress, economic stress, is because you've got these big macroeconomic factors coming into play. And it's keeping them at the lower end of these tables. You know, they're in the 25 to 35. A, a lot of these folks are in these 25 to 35 um, uh, cohorts here or, or columns here. And you can see that they're not able to save very much, um, if anything at all, really, uh, aside from, you know, just putting a lot aside a little bit of money every, every year to kind of give themselves a, a cash cushion that allows them to survive. And so... Uh, Anyway, those are some uh, some principles as budgeting. You can sort of see, you know, the, the reason we have a progressive tax is because it makes sense that people who are less likely to consume today should pay more in taxes um, because the people who are more likely to consume today need the money to, to, to live. Um, and you'll notice that we're not talking about outrageous uh, living here. You know, the uh, Paul Krugman, economist, uh, Nobel Prize winning economist, and he's a columnist for... Um, the uh, uh, New York Times just wrote a thing about the the myth of the lazy unemployed. I mean, the fact of the matter is people in poverty, people at the lower end of our economic spectrum are extremely creative when it comes to stretching their dollar because they have to be. And that the overwhelming majority, I mean, 80, 85 percent of the people who are unemployed want to work. They're not trying to be they're not trying to, to, to make it on somebody else's dime. And so, um, you know, we lose sight of that. We see tons of anecdotes and people always trot out the, the anecdotes and you'll always find them of the lazy person, the person that's happy to take the, uh, happy to take somebody else's hand out and not, not give anything back. But that is, uh, that's not, that's not the norm. That's not the reality. That's not really what goes on. So, um, so anyway, so what, how does this look to your, uh, to your budget when you're, uh, when you're looking at your, at your budget in mind? I mean, are, do these numbers look, Again, and these are annual numbers, so you'd have to divide by 12 to get your monthly budget. But do these look like? Uh, um, I definitely uh, spend quite a bit more on housing. Yeah. Um, but that's partially because I made that decision to live alone. Uh, but I spend less on groceries, so go team. Yeah. Uh, that's another vegan perk. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, protein um, is expensive, right? Meat, uh, dairy, those are expensive relative to... Uh, plant-based uh, foods true yep. and I'm lucky enough to like also have the time to prepare the vegan foods because that that's one of the things that's it's cheaper in terms of money to buy vegan food but it's more expensive in terms of time so if you're someone who's working two three jobs seven days a week and you only have two hours to make food at the end of the day it's you're not going to do what I do when I come home from work and make tacos with like refried homemade black beans and all this stuff that takes a couple hours to do because yeah. you just don't have that time and you need the calories faster. Yeah. So I am fortunate in that way. Uh, don't pay property insurance. So that's nice. <laughs> and I don't pay for health insurance either. So right now I'm able to save a little more, but uh, True. that's yeah. pretty close to it. Okay. I mean, I'm so saving this more. Out, this doesn't look like out of out of line at all. Uh, no. All right. Good. Okay. So that's uh, that's our uh, chart for the day. Um, so how do you live? I mean, the other part of today's question was how do you live to the budget? Once you set up the budget, right? How do you how do you live? Right? How do you live to it? And Sadly. a lot of it is what's that? Sadly. Well, we all want more than we have. That's certainly a uh, true truism. Um, but I think you know it's it's uh, it really comes down to it, it's it comes down to discipline. Um, but there's certainly certain techniques that you can use to uh, 
uh, to uh, be more effective and, and be allow yourself to live more intentionally. Um, you know, one of the uh, you know one of the things that you really want to do. I mean, basically, you want to uh, you want to create some controls so that you're not spending unbudgeted amounts. Right? I mean, the whole point of putting a budget together is to be intentional about what you're spending and undisciplined decisions, spontaneous, spur of the moment decisions, um, those impulse buys uh, that, that companies work very hard to find, figure out how to make you do, um, you know, those all, those all work counter to, you know, those, that, that's on the other, you know, those are the headwinds that you run into when you're trying to live to a budget. And so what are some of the techniques that you can use to live to your budget? Um, you know, certainly when I was in the corporate world, um, you know, we used a tool, uh, well, we have a lot of financial controls, but probably the most, the, the most uh, prominent and the one that was probably most effective is the approval process. So um, when you're an employee at a, at a large firm, you're allowed to spend a certain amount of money without having to seek additional approvals. And so, you know, at Schwab, I think senior managers were allowed to spend... Uh, Five thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, something like that, and these will move up and down as the company either needs to save money or is comfortable that they can be spending. But uh, basically, what it meant was, if you're a if you're a, a manager level employee, and, and a, you know one of your team members had signed up for a uh, 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 a training class that cost twenty five hundred dollars, you could approve that without getting your manager to sign off on that. You're allowed to approve that. You're allowed to spend that. Um, if you wanted to, you know, if you were working on a project and the vendor wanted ten thousand dollars for the project, um, you you know, with a with an signing authority of five thousand dollars, you you'd have to get your manager or whoever in that hierarchy had the the authority to approve a ten thousand dollar expense uh, to sign off on it. So these would be very structured. And if you ever signed off on a project, committed the company to a project that you did not have authority to do, uh, you would be disciplined. Um, and probably fired. Um, you know, discipline uh, has many sort of. Uh, you know, there's a whole range of disciplinary options, but that one was pretty bad. Um, and especially if it was in the time when a uh, company was trying to uh, keep expenses low, uh, was in expense control mode uh, in particular. So, you know, how do the, how do you translate some of those lessons to your personal relationships? Well, I mean, if you share a budget with a partner, um, you know, if you're in a family, you've got a husband, wife, or partner or, or just roommates that you're sharing expenses with and and you're sharing the whole budget it's not just okay well we're only sharing rent or whatever but if you're sharing a whole budget um, you know there's some accountability to each other in that situation um, you know maybe you decide okay you know what I can spend anything up to fifty dollars you know without having to check in but if I want to spend more than that I have to get you to agree that that we can spend that I can spend this this seventy five dollars or this hundred and fifty dollars or whatever it is on on this thing, and you know I have to make the case for it. So, um, you know, you you can do it that way where where you can say, okay, uh, I'll check in. So you know, your mother and I obviously we're uh, you know we share a budget, and um, you know if if we have a significant expense that we haven't talked about. We're gonna, you know, I, I'd be, I'll be a little angry if she goes and spends that, and likewise, she will be angry with me if without checking in. And so, you know, that that that's certainly one thing you can do. If you're if you're managing your budget yourself, you can still actually do this by checking in with your future self. In other words, your self, 24 hours from now, has to agree to spend that money. Mm -hmm. so if you want to go, you know, if you if you've spent your money, if you on on going out to eat, and you're like, you know, I really want to go out to eat tonight. But I, it's not in my budget. You know what you what what you would do is say, you know what, I won't go out to eat tonight. But if tomorrow night I also want to go out to eat, then I will. And you know, then I then my my future self will approve that expenditure. Uh, then that's good. Um, it works better for things like uh, goods purchases. Like, boy, I really like that leather jacket. You know, do you like it because you're in the store right now and it looks great and everything? Twenty four hours from now, are you going to like it as much? Maybe. But maybe not. And so, you know, one, one way you can do that is to, is to get the approval of yourself, but not the self in this moment, the self 24 hours from now. Um, so you've had a chance to think about it. Another way to do it is to use cash. And this is something that your mother and I did uh, early in our marriage is we would, you know, we would limit ourselves to, you know, whatever, $100 a week each. And we could spend that cash however we wanted without having to, you know, justify it at all. Um, 
by having that cash, you know, basically it also limits you. If you're going out to eat and you're saying, okay, well, I'm only, I'm, I'm going to limit myself to $50. Well, it's easy when you're out, you've had a drink and now you want dessert because the dessert looks extra good or whatever. And, and if you've got a credit card, you know, you're like, well, maybe that becomes 65 pretty easy. because I'm um, If you're paying in cash, it's a whole different thing. And I know that the millennials and zoomers aren't really about cash. But it can be a very it can be a very powerful tool to help you stay on budget by by making you by making you spend um, when you're not in a pandemic. Well, if, if yeah, if if people will take it, if people will take it, um, you know, some other some other hacks I guess around budgets is doing the you know shared expense. I mean, you 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 hit on it when you said that you you know you chose to live alone, um, so you have more privacy. Um, you know, but sharing expenses, sharing housing expense with roommates, um, you know, looking into car share, uh, ride share, uh, transportation stuff, things like that, um, you know, are, are, are other ways. You know, meals are cheaper when you prepare them for more than one person. Um, you know, uh, all of those things can kind of come into, you know, those are ways that you can reduce some of these expenses, which give you more savings. Um, and, uh, as we'll talk about, I'm sure in future uh, future calls, the uh, uh, saving and investing is a, uh, the capital. You know, we'll talk about labor and capital because those are two really powerful forces in economics and uh, um, you know time versus money. And and having money is a uh, you know is great because it takes it out of your effort. You you don't have to you don't have to exert any effort for your money to make money. Whereas for labor, it's all effort. Um, so anyway, we'll talk more about that, but to create more capital that you can invest, which allows you then, um, you know, greater income, uh, or, and eventually by saving for retirement, uh, you know, the opportunity to not have to spend your time working to make money. Um, you know, that's what, you know, these are, these are, these are techniques that you can use to kind of increase those savings, uh, you know, which can help you get some time independence uh, for you. And then the other piece is uh, substitution, different way of substitution. This isn't the substitution around uh, labor market substitution and economic stuff, but you know, substitute uh, you know a bike for a car or walking for a bike. You know, there's there's expenses, um, you know, with a car that are much higher than if you're riding a bike. Now, you know, you don't get to go with people on your bike, and you don't, you know, and if it's raining or snowing, that's a challenge. Uh, but you know, I was in Chicago. Uh, probably a year and a half ago in the wintertime, and um, there were people driving the bike, riding the bikes in snow. Um, you know, so it can be done, but there's sacrifices. Obviously, you have a car because it's convenient and it's nice to be out of the rain and cold um, or stiflingly hot uh, uh, heat. Um, you know, and the other thing we've talked a little bit about was the whole foods versus processed foods. I mean, if you're paying somebody to make the food more accessible to you, i.e., processing it. The, it's going to be it's going to be more expensive, um, as opposed to buying the whole food itself and then and then processing it yourself, making it yourself. So, uh, and the plant versus animal protein is another way to look at it. You know, you you have nutritional needs, but there are a lot of different ways to finish to 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 meet those needs, and some of them are more cost effective than others. Um, and finally, you know, you like to go out to eat, and that's cool and everything. A lot of people like to go out to movies or you know go to go to the the bars and, and everything. And, um, you know, one way to cut expenses is to insource your entertainment instead of outsourcing it. Um, you know, back in the day when people were in the countryside and the farming uh, communities and everything, they'd just get together for a hoedown, right? They'd get together. They would create their own entertainment. They would come. Uh, well, you did this at Belmont, too. You guys would get together and sing in, uh, in a little bit. Sometimes, right? So that's a way to entertain yourselves in the evening with very, with very little cost. Um, is to insource entertainment, to, to, to get together and do game night. Um, instead of going out to a bar or going out to a club or going out to a concert, you know, bring, bring the music in. If you like music, bring musical friends together and play uh, for each other. Um, those are different types of ways that you can, uh, you know, you can improve your, uh, your budget. So how do you, I mean, so we talked a little bit about how you keep on track to your budget. Um, you kind of keep a mental note of uh, what you're spending. Um, have you, I mean, what kind of techniques, have you tried any of these techniques or is there other things that you would suggest? Uh, I mean, I grew up with you. So <laughs> being conscious of how much I'm spending is just kind of, you know, second nature at this point. The most um, exciting episode we'll ever have <laughs> this. I mean, I just like, 
processed versus whole foods. We always got whole foods growing up. I didn't really do frozen meals ever. We never really did. Yeah, we had snacks and stuff that we would get, but it was like dinner was put together from various things. Like remember early on when I was dating Jalen, current boyfriend, um, I was cooking something and asked him to peel garlic for me. And he was like, I've never seen anyone do this. I was like, it's like 50 cents to get a bulb of garlic versus like $2 for a jar of minced garlic. Like, yeah. so one of those things, um, I haven't done the future self thing and I liked to do cash, but trying to get it out of an ATM and then it charges me to get my own money, which yeah. is not. So I used to, I liked it when I got, got cash tips, but that doesn't happen in the vet industry. <laughs> Not a, it's not a best practice in the event industry. Okay. No, they don't just like pass me pass me dollars for dealing with their angry chihuahua, which you know they should, yeah. but yeah. they don't. All right. Don't. Cool. All right. So that's our topic today. I hopefully it was helpful. Uh, I don't know that we'll ever have a topic more exciting as we've said. <laughs> we have any follow up items here? We need to research anything. I don't think so. Is there anything we needed? Anything came up in our discussion that we need to get back to people on? We gotta. We do have to debate if cats or dogs are the better pet. <laughs> we owe it coming. to the fans. We uh, owe it yeah, to we'll the add fans. that to our. Uh, well, it's on the list. Uh, Sarah from Indiana. <laughs> no. So uh, very good. And uh, no Venmo. I, three episodes and no swearing. This is astonishing to me. I thought you would be into me for ten, twelve bucks by now. But listen, sorry, I, I live mean, in the south. Me. I would thought that you would owe me ten to twelve dollars by now. I live in the South and I work in a customer facing job. Swearing is not really a thing you can do. Right, which is why I thought it would come out here. Um, no. All right. Very Great. good at turning off the swearing. Uh, apparently, better than I expected. So good for you, though. I'm proud. Very nice. All right. All right. Wrap us up here, Red. Okay, great. Well, our lovely listeners can find us on awkwardfamilyconversations.com. You can find us on Twitter. I always forget what the handle is because it's something weird. Well, I think it's at awkwardfamc01 or something because they've truncated our... Uh, That's cute. Our you know you can change that, right? Can we? Can we extend it? Yeah. Or? Oh, okay. I'll look into that. Okay. <laughs> um, and we were still working on getting a podcast host and also a more responsible audio engineer. And we're on YouTube, aren't we? I'm trying it. And we are on YouTube at Awkward Family Conversations. So let us know what you think. Comment on our Facebook posts. Comment on YouTube. Text one of us if you know us that well. <laughs> and next time we will tackle how do I find a job I enjoy. That sounds great. All right. Well, I love you, Dad. Love you too, Ed. We'll see you soon. <laughs>